Hello, and welcome to the Aquarius Podcast, your source for interviews with people from all across the tropical fish keeping hobby. I'm your host, Randy Reed. Please subscribe and check out all previous episodes on Podbean, Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, or AquarisPodcast.com. You can also check out additional content by following the Aquarius Podcast Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. If you like what you hear, please rate and leave a review for the show. Enjoy the interview. Today's date is Friday, June 29th, 2018. My guest today is Greg Sage. Greg is a lifelong hobbyist and owner of SelectAquatics.com. Greg has given countless fish club talks on subjects like keeping and breeding green dragon plecos, live bearers, selective breeding, starting a home-based fish business, and setting up and maintaining a fish room. Greg has also been an active participant in the American Live Bearer Association, having served as chairman for two terms. So Greg, welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. Oh, thanks, Randy. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I mean, you... Try to help you out in... Yeah? Yeah, no, Sorry. definitely. Thank, no, thank you very much. Like I was saying, we, <laughs> sometimes when we connect on this thing, we have uh, we have a little bit of a, of a delay between the cell phone call and the Google Hangouts call, so uh, no worries. But Greg, thank you very much for, for coming on. You are an absolute uh, fountain of knowledge, and you know I've watched many of the uh, the educational videos and perused selectaquatics.com to get a lot of really good insight and information, so uh, it's an honor to have you on, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to talking to you. So let's get started with how did Greg Sage get started in the fish keeping hobby and you know when when was that and kind of walk me through what what your beginning in the hobby was like. Well, I I grew up in a in a really blue collar section of northern Ohio and um I was kind of a strange kid and I had a couple of tanks of well I I had the opportunity to buy some aquariums when I was in 7th grade. I managed to I think it was like 15 bucks. I got a 5 gallon, a 10 gallon and a 15 gallon aquarium. And um, I was kind of a loner kid and uh, often in fights and such. And, but I had these tanks in, in my bedroom, and I was raising guppies, and I started selling, selling fish to local fish stores and uh, found that I could uh, uh, do something where I was contributing to the, the area and get known for something other than just being a, um, you know, an interesting character at school. So, um, and I've been, been breeding and keeping fish pretty much ever since. Um, I didn't get into having a big fish room until getting into about the mid nineties. Um, and at that point I obtained some, I'd always wanted to, I've always kept live bears, but I, I really wanted to keep some of the big fancy sword tails and some of the, 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 uh, the other, the elite fish that I had always heard about, but never really seen. So I joined the ALA, um, in about 1996. Um, and so I was in the group for about, I don't know, maybe a few months. And I, I, I had joined the San Francisco Aquarium Society, and I picked up some fish and brought them home. And I was told that they were Zephyrus Montezuma, which has come to be, you know, one of my favorite fish. Um, but they didn't look like Montezumas that I had remembered seeing pictures of. And so I was raising them at home, and I thought, you know, here I'm a member of this new organization, and I've got these fish, and I don't know what they are, and I can't tell what they look, you know, can't tell what they are. I looked at books, didn't make any sense. So I, I went ahead and I wrote an email letter uh, to uh, everybody on the inside cover of the ALA journal, and I, and I, and I sent a picture, uh, you know, a digital picture, and I said, you know, does anybody know what this fish is? Can anybody help me? I'm a new member, yada, yada. Well, I think I sent out, I sent out something uh, close to 20, uh, 20 uh, emails to people, and not a single person responded back to me. So, <laughs> so I was on this live bearer list, and a good friend on the live bearer list was someone named Jim Langhammer. And I didn't know that Jim Langhammer was one of the founding members of the ALA. And so I was uh, writing one day on the, on the list, and I was talking to Jim, and I said, what kind of a two-bit organization did I join? This is, Jim, help me here. You know, these, what's the deal here? I mean, I, I can't believe that uh, I sent out all these emails and nobody responded back to me to at least tell me what the name of this fish is. So <laughs> Jim writes me back and says, if you're going to complain, run for office, you know, don't just bitch and moan, you know, do something to, to change it. And then he told me how, you know, he was one of the founding people of the ALA, and he was, you know, very intimately knowledgeable about it. So I felt pretty terrible about that, and I went ahead and, and did apply and got onto the board and ended up getting elected the, the chairman, and I, I was chairman from 2000 to 2004. And one of the first things I did was I put a column into the, into the uh, trader. You know, if you've got some fish, you don't know what they are or how to take care of them or you need some information on taking care of things, you know, here are the people to contact. And, so anyway, I felt that I made a big change, and I, you know, I, I got involved really heavily and changed the publications, got everything going, 
and they were, you know, everything was going really well, and I got out of being the ALA chair in about 2004. But at about 2000, I started taking buckets of fish with me in the back of my car to the conventions and then selling them out of my hotel room. And uh, by, oh, I don't know, 2005 or so, I was bringing 30 buckets of fish to the conventions and selling a lot of fish out of my room. What, well, so, the ALA at that time. I'm can, sorry. Can I stop you there, Craig? Because I have to ask what are what are the hotel yeah, what do the hotel people think uh, seeing you you know come in with buckets and buckets and you're taking them up to your hotel room? Did you get any strange looks or did they come and ask you any questions? Well, when, when you're when you've got an ALA convention going on at a hotel, uh, it, it, there are usually dozens of people that are that are doing exactly the same thing. And what used to amaze me was um, you when in the early days until about 2005. They, they used to put everybody on the same floor, and then everybody would put a list on their door of all the fish they had in their rooms. And then when you went into their rooms, you know, you have the, the dresser drawer and all that, and everything would be full of fish bags. And some people even brought in aquariums with stands and stuff and set these things up in their hotel rooms. And I, and I remember seeing this the first few times thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, the hotel, what must they think of this? But uh, they were always, you know, pretty good about it, and I, I assume that, you know, those that took care of the arrangements uh, were clear up front that this was what it was going to be. So, uh, to my knowledge, there were very few big accidents, you know, where water was spilled or anything was damaged. It didn't, didn't happen very often. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I, I, I think, uh, you know, if, if anybody was on the fence about going to a convention, um, if that was a practice that was still in place where people were like, hey, you know, we're all going to be on this floor and it's going to be this bizarre style swap meet of, you know, going door to door hotel rooms and just checking out what people have to offer for fish. I mean, that's, <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, Oh, it was fabulous, and it's you know it's a lot like if you ever been to some of the you know rock conventions or the reptile conventions or various things, and they're they're done very similarly. Um, but unfortunately, around two thousand five, two thousand six, um, the uh, the clubs arranged for hotels, and there were a couple hotels that were that were where the conventions were held that had things like password protected floors and things were, and then they went ahead and they would put everybody throughout the hotel and not put them on the same floor for whatever reason. Uh, and the the ethic, the 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 atmosphere of going to a convention with your pockets full of money to buy fish from people in their hotel rooms ended. Um, and so the, the ALA has been working since to try to get fish back at the conventions and you know and get people selling again. And I, I understand from this last convention went really well and it was much better than they've been in the past. So um, you know I'm glad to hear that. So I, I have a question um, about yeah, the about mm-hmm. the logistics of all that. So um, I, I guess, you know, while you're the chairman of the, the ALA and you're very active in the conventions, um, you know, geographically, where were you living? Um, and were the conventions, to my knowledge, conventions kind of every year, it's uh, a different club will host a different convention, um, you know, for, right. for one of these larger, um, you know, organizations. So uh, I, I guess... You know, what's the farthest that you've traveled from home where you've purchased fish and, you know, you've had to bring them back home? Or I guess what's the farthest you've actually right. brought fish to a convention? Well, the first three years of Select Aquatics, I did 14 trips to various shows and conventions around the country. And I, li- I live here in, uh, just north of Denver. Um, and I went to all four corners of the country. I did things in Seattle, Anaheim, Fort Lauderdale, and... Uh, uh, Fall River in Massachusetts. Uh, that's I, you know those are ones I drove to, but I also drove to everywhere else throughout the U.S. So I had no problem with it. And um, but generally, a lot of the hobbyists you know would let, would prefer to have the the conventions in where they could drive you know within two three hours of their their homes. And the result was that when you had a convention, you had all these people driving up with trucks and such with their back with their beds full of styrofoam boxes full of fish. And so everybody would get there to try to catch the people that they knew were going to be bringing in the biggest, the biggest loads of fish. It was always a hoot to try and catch them to get things from them before, you know, before they'd sold out. Um, but those were, those were the, it was some really exciting years, early 2000s. And, uh, so we, yeah, yeah. And at that time you could find just about anything in, like in the Atlas of Live Bears, uh, over a period of maybe three years, you'd see almost everything in the book at some point, um, which was always very exciting. So you'd see fish you wouldn't see anywhere else, that sort of thing. And so then your progression then from, um, you know, as the chairman of the ALA, I guess since you since you've stepped down from that role or you've you've moved on, um, has your fish room gotten larger? Has has Select Aquatics become a a bigger part of um, of what you're doing, or has it has it kind of tapered back a little bit? 
Well, it's it's uh, um, when the sales and things started really slowing down around 2006, 2007, 2008. Um, I started uh, uh, looking into selling uh, fish online and, and shipping and, you know, putting up occasional ads on Aquabit, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, also to, to meet the need for people who were looking for a lot of the fish that used to appear at conventions but were no longer there. And so I remember well the, 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 the low-hanging fruit, you know, all the, the fish that you always looked forward to seeing at a convention and they weren't always guaranteed to be there anymore, like the Zephophorus monazuma or the Limia nagrafasciata or the Xenotoka doodroi and lion's eye and all these different kinds of fish that were always common but were, were, were becoming hard to find. So I thought, well, I could pick 25 or 30 of those and have them available year-round, and then people can still get them from the convention, but um, you know, I would do my best to provide them year-round, and I would set my prices based on a, uh, just a little bit below what you would pay at the convention for them so that you know, it wasn't extravagant, that sort of thing. So Select Aquatics officially started in October of 2009. Um, I'm entering my 10th year uh, here this October, um, and so it's done, it's done really well. And so uh, when I first started, I had 60 tanks. And I had about 150 of the red Krakodon lateralis, and I thought, now I'm in good shot. I'm in good shape for this, and having this fish around, it's a really neat red gadea, and everybody likes it. And I wasn't even open six months, and somebody came in and spent over a thousand dollars and bought up all of my lateralis. So ever since the company's been open, I've been wrestling with it because that's a very slow breeding fish. I've been wrestling with keeping their numbers up. However, with that money. I went ahead and put it all into tanks and stands and racks and uh, really expanded the, the, the room. And so now, today, I'm, I'm at about 120 tanks. I think there's about 3,500 gallons uh, in all. And uh, it's all on automatic water change systems. And, and uh, um, there's still a lot of work to do, but I don't have to carry buckets as much as I used to, that sort of thing. But I, I have a policy where I don't put anything down there unless I can take 100% care of it. You know, I'm... I'm really big on not having a tank sitting off in a corner in the dark or whatever that <laughs> seems to get ignored. Because like most fish keepers, I think we've all been there. And so the whole point of this is they have a room that uh, that, that works uh, organically, you know, from top to bottom, and that everything's getting the same care and, and all of that. So that's kind of what I spend a lot of my time on, is making sure that the room is consistent and, and it works well. So the the customer that came in and, and wiped you out of the uh, the lateralis, uh, 160 some odd fish, I mean, I'm getting this vision of my head of this, you know, hardcore German breeder guy flying to Colorado and just, you know, plunking down some greenbacks to wipe you out to take them back to Europe and set up an operation. Oh, I, yeah. mean, I mean, how much can you divulge of, of you know, what was that, what was that customer going to do with so many? Well, it was funny because what that customer was, and I still, I still have some contact with him. He was a guy from California, and he was actually looking for, and this happens occasionally. People see that I've got something, and they think, wow, if he can breed it, then I must be able to breed it, um, even though I've never kept the fish before. And then I'm going to make a bunch of money, so I'm going to buy them up, and then I'm going to make a bunch of money on it. So he bought all my lateralis because he thought that was my coolest fish. But um, he ended up, uh, unbelievably, pretty much, well, let's just say that all the fish that he bought from me no longer are no longer around. Oh, man. Um, and I don't know that he was ever, I don't know that he was even successful at getting many of them sold on Aquabed. But that happens sometimes. You know, I have people like that with, with Green Dragons. I plopped out a ton of money. I'm going to make a fortune on Green Dragons. But they just don't realize, that, you know, how difficult some of these fish can be to breed and how, how tough they can be to keep going. Not all of them are very easy. And I, mm-hmm. and I guess I would frame it like, you know, as, as you kind of gave your, you know, your, your beginnings in the hobby, you were just a kid that, you know, really liked fish and really liked breeding fish. And it was very much, you know, a, a labor of love for you. Um, and Select Aquatics has been so successful because, you know, you're a hobbyist first. And I would have to assume that, you know, turning a profit is kind of a secondary motive for you. Um, right. Like as, as a kid, as, as a kid, young Greg, Greg Sage wasn't sitting there in Northern Ohio thinking I'm going to take over the world by, you know, becoming a millionaire and selling fish. Right. I mean, it's just something that you, not you in became... a zillion years. No, <laughs> um, not at all. And, and actually I, I did have my eyes on that sort of thing. I mean, I worked very hard and pursued, I chased the brass ring in the music industry for, about, oh my goodness, 30, 40 years. And, um, I toured for 15 years with different bands and, and I've got many recordings out and all kinds of things along those lines. So I certainly had that brass ring thing going on with, with something else. But with fish, it's it, like even today, 
you know, like sometimes people will come into the room and, you know, like, like store owner people, and they say, well, you know, each tank has to turn 30 bucks a month or I get rid of the tank. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. If I thought that way in my room, I would go under in no time um, because I have lots of breeding projects going on. I have things going on that are based on hope and just the excitement that these might amount to something someday. <laughs> I have some lines I've been working with for six, seven years that have never been mentioned at the website that, you know, just so that when, you know, out of the blue, when this gets introduced, people go, wow, you know, I've never had no idea. So, you know, my my head and my heart are in are in the fish, uh, the fish that I develop, and also maintaining without developing or out doing, without doing any special, specialty breeding of a lot of these wild live bears that have to be maintained in the hobby. Um, all I do with those is I just maintain the healthiest colonies I can, and I try to maintain them in as large of numbers as I can so that I only send the best fish to customers. Um, but I don't selectively breed uh, any of my wildlife bears. Um, the only exceptions to that are the, the, the two wildlife bears that I have, uh, or three li- wildlife bears that I have uh, selectively bred forms of, and that's the gold alvarezi, the red lateralis, uh, and the iliadon persidens. Yeah, so I, but I guess, all the rest of them are bred just like they are. I'm yeah, sorry? So, so I, no, no worries. Um, so I guess that's a good segue yeah. into, um, you know, how did you get started keeping, you know, these fish that uh, are, are either endangered in the wild or they're extinct in the wild? Um, and I know certainly as, you know, I'm now the, the CARES chairperson for the Greater Seattle Aquarium sure. Society. And so I want to do everything that I can. I actually, I think that your tequila's um, zoo, zoogenetic... I'll, I'll butcher uh-huh, that name. Genetic is tequila. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that one. Um, there's a couple club members that actually have um, that strain from you. Um, so that's oh, pre- okay. that, uh-huh. the, yeah, that's pretty cool. We actually have that as a registered um, care species for one of our members. Uh, but it's really cool to see that you have these fish that um, you know they're they're endangered in the wild, they're extinct in the wild, and that you are a source where people can go and if they want to participate in the CARES program and they want to keep, um, hopefully for the long term, one of these uh, at-risk fish species and get points in our, and at least in our, you know, mini little competition right. that we're doing for our club, that you mm-hmm. actually have um, stock in, in some of these at the current moment uh, that somebody can purchase and they can actually start keeping. And, and in my conversation with Greg Steves from the CARES organization, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the fish, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of difficult. Like, you know, they, they, the CARES program will list and say, hey, here are the species, um, you know, by family, by, you know, rainbow fishes and rice fishes and loaches and all that. But, uh, you know, short of looking on Aquabit, it's almost impossible to five, find some of these fish unless you're going to actually go out there in the wild and catch them. But if somebody did right. want to get involved, they could go to your site, you know, select aquatics and, you know, hopefully be able to purchase some from you. Well, and there's two things about the CARES program that I need to really mention um, that, that, you're, that you're bringing up. The first is if you, if you belong to the CARES program, which is an excellent program, and I, I'm totally in support of it, is that when you get these fish, you need to keep them for longer than six months or a year or two years. You know, you, they really should be something you hold on to. And if you aren't able to, then you make sure that they go somewhere that will keep them going. And the, the second thing that's important, because they aren't just get them to for their entertainment value because they're really rare, and, and, and that, you know, there's a lot of people that do that. Um, the second thing, which is even more important, is that when you get a CARES fish or you get something from me that's really rare and it doesn't do well for you, don't freak out, you know, and give up on it. <laughs> that's that's how you learn. And it's the people who are going to keep it for the longest time and who are going to have the most success and the most luck with it are those who are going to keep trying and keep coming back at it even when their fish die. Some people have written to me, I would never buy a rare fish from you because I'd just kill it. Well, if you really want that fish, you're exactly who I want to buy the fish from me because I'll help you in every way that I can so they'll be successful for you. But if you do make a mistake and you do lose them, I'll help you to get some more stock so that you won't make that mistake again, and you're ahead of the other hobbyists that has never kept that fish. I I had the the the, the, the Zugeneticus tequila four times before I had a population that continued to live for me. I lost I lost that fish the first three times I obtained it, and it was it was for a number of reasons, probably as much my fault as it was the the fact that the stock I got may or may not have been healthy, but. Um, you know, it was, it was the fourth time was a charm for me. And, and so it, uh, I finally got them going steadily with the line that's done well for me back about 2001. So I've had them now for 17 years and I've shipped out thousands to the hobby. So, you know, the fa- if I had given up on the third try, then they would never have gone out to anybody and, and, uh, you know, my contribution would not have ever happened. 
So, you know, for those of you who want to keep them, if you generally want to keep them, they're not always the easiest fish to keep. Some of them are, most of them are pretty easy to keep, but there's some knowledge that's associated with everything. And uh, so, you, so you know, you want to work with someone who's going to work with you so that you will be successful with them. Greg, I, I think um, that's anyway. a really, I think that's a really powerful message that you know you're you're sharing with this audience that hey, you know, even Greg Sage, even the guy that has an amazing fish room and he's incredibly successful um, breeding these fish, that you have had your faults, you have had your you know shortcomings, and you've had losses of certain fish, but you kept at it. Um, and you were oh, successful, God, yes. yeah. and, and not only that you had the perseverance to do that, but you're telling other people, no, 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 don't give up. Because honestly, like my, the way I would view it is, if I got some of your fish and I killed them, you know, for whatever uh -huh. reason, I, the last thing I would want to do is reach out to you, right? And not not just because it's you, <laughs> right, right. but I would hate to reach out <laughs> to the person that you know sold me these fish, regardless of me giving them money. I would feel embarrassed. I would feel like you were going to light me up over the phone and chew me out for killing these endangered <laughs> fish. But to hear you say, like, no, like, that's not that's not what this hobby is about. That's not what you're about. Um, let me help you right. persevere uh, and stay right. at it and keep at it because these fish are worth it, right? And this hobby's worth it. So I, and, I think that's and amazing. And I, I do this with a lot of customers I, I, that lose them and they do have the, the spine to call me back or let me know they didn't do well. Sometimes I'll even send them out a new batch, you know, for no, I mean, you'll pay shipping, but, you know, um, uh, I've often sent out a new batch when the first batch hasn't done well after the first couple of weeks because the initial uh, acclimation issues didn't go well. Um, oh, yeah, I want to make sure that these survive because I can't do this forever, you know. I mean, I'm getting older, so um, I would hate to have me get out of this and then find that uh, the things I, I added to the hobby are gone in six months, you know. So it's really pleasing when I get some customers that write me and send me pictures to show me how their colonies have thrived and done really well, and here's how things are going. Yeah, and, and I would say people should check out your website, selectaquatics.com, uh, not only just to see the fish that you have for sale or at least the ones that maybe they're not available right now, but you have sold in the past and probably will sell again once uh, they become available, and we can talk more about the various species, but just the vast sure. knowledge that you have for each of the species that you offer, but then in, in a mm -hmm. whole other, um, just a library of tropical fish related topics. I mean, you have so much knowledge on here that I would almost challenge somebody before. If you want to look up something in our hobby, um, if you have a question, instead of going to Google, mm -hmm. go to Greg's Select Aquatics page to, first and see if he's already put out a page or two of information or content that might answer your question. I mean, you've you've covered so many different things on this website, right? It, this is not just a storefront for you. This is like a storefront, but behind the store is a massive library of fish knowledge. And I think that's super cool that people need to know about your website. It's not not just an e-commerce site. It's like it's a library. Well, and I do that not only because um, it's nice to have the information up there and all the stories people talk about how there's no books available anymore and people don't buy books and all that. The, the biggest single reason it's there is because a lot of the things I sell are not things that are commonly kept. And the last thing I want to do is send stuff out to people that aren't going to do well. So, for instance, when people want good ideas, and they write me about, you know, buying a Gudea. I make sure that the website has tons of information to let you know that, you know, most of the Gudeas are really easy to keep. They're really prolific. They're, you know, great fish. However, they don't do well when the temperatures get warmer. You know, some species are worse than others. Some species you can't let get over 74 degrees. But most people wouldn't know that unless, you know, I've actually considered putting out like a printouts from the website, like on each species. So when you order something, you get a couple pages that tell you how to keep that species. And I figured that was a bit much. I, you know, I, people, I don't know, maybe it would be a good idea, but I just haven't put the effort into making that up. But that's, that's the point of the website is that, you know, and so I usually take care of a lot of that when people first write me. That's one of the reasons why I write everyone. Um, uh, so I can make sure that, that the basic knowledge, you know, you've got under your belt before I send these out to you so that the, the experience is good for you. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I write every, like when you, when you want to order from me, just, Send me an email at uh, selectaquatics at gmail dot com, uh, whatever it is, whatever it's about, and then I just work it out with you. Uh, there's no there's no forms at the website. There's no shopping carts. I tried doing a lot of that sort of things, but there's so many variables involved in all the different species. Whether you want them at two to four months, or you want them at pairs, or you want them however, um, and then the shipping changes, you know, based on the weight of the fish and the amount of water they use, and so all that stuff is just slowly built up in my head. So now I can say, okay, so many fish. 
to where and it's going to cost you this much. Um, and then I just keep in touch with every customer and make, and then I follow each package and, you know, make sure that it gets to you safely and, uh, and that it's a good experience for you. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. And, and so with, uh, yeah. how, how did you start keeping the, the good deeds then? Well, the, uh, the to, to, to tie this back into when we first started talking, I joined the ALA for the fancy sortails, and I get in there, and I'm looking for these things, and I don't find them anywhere. And I was, I, I, I didn't find anybody that had, I assumed that there were all these American breeders that, you know, were breeding huge Hellerai swords and liar tails and hyphens and all this. And I, I, there were a couple, but the focus of the organization and the majority of the membership were people who were keeping wildlife bears. And so when you go to the convention, here's all these bags of all these, all these fish that you don't know. And then eventually you learn what a good deed is and what a good deed isn't. And, uh, you know, what a Pacilli it is and what a Pacilli it isn't. And, and, uh, the different types of, uh, families and, you know, uh, just from, just from time of getting and looking at all the fish. And you find out from talking with people, which are the highly desired things. And, and, uh, so you start bringing it home from conventions and, uh, that's kind of how I got started. And, I, you know, the only, re- the only reason I have any knowledge today is because I made all the mistakes at some point in my past. Um, you know, I think that's the case with most people. But you, you, at one point you asked me about my failures. I can't say that I have any failures, but I have a few successes that really took me an awful long time to <laughs> to figure out. You know, and that's because I had failures one after the other forever, and I just figured, okay, one more bit of knowledge, move on to the next step, and then eventually it pulled together. The the videos that I just posted yesterday on the breeding the Cynodonus lucipinus is a perfect example. I literally spent six years of making every mistake in the book, and I didn't get eggs at all even for two years. So, you know, that fish just kept my ego in check for the first few years of like aquatics. There's no question. So I was determined to figure it out, and I did. And now I've got them breeding consistently and in large numbers. And I thought, well, you know, what the hell? Why don't I go ahead and share it with everybody? So uh, that's the two videos that I just put up yesterday. And so far, the response has been really pet positive. Yeah, that, that is awesome. Like I was, um, I mentioned uh, prior to, to us actually kicking this conversation off that I've watched the first, I think, 10 or 15 minutes of it. Um, I was at work when I was kind of tuning, tuning in and out listening and, um, you know, hearing you talk about how long it's taken you to become successful and, and you know, this multi-tank formula that you've set up. Um, and, you know, some people would think, and, and I think you even actually talked about this, you know, you want to share your secrets. Um, and people would say, well, no, Greg, like you just struck gold. You bred the Synodontus lucipinus. You know, you can make a bunch of money right. now because people really want that. But when you watch your video, you're you're sharing everything, but you're putting in a ton of work. Like you have a oh, yeah. lot of dedication. <laughs> like this isn't something where, you know, somebody's going to set up a 20 long and throw them in there and scoop out some fry and you're good to go. Like this is <laughs> this is a very, very involved process that you have set up. Well, and that's the other reason. That's one of the other big reasons why I put that up is because I've sold a lot of these guys. And from talking to some big breeders like Eric Bodrock and others, and I said, has no one selectively bred these for the really nice white fish? And he said, no, because most people are so pleased just to breed it. You know, no one selectively bred it. So now that I've got this dialed in, that's exactly what I'm doing. And I've got some real nice ones, you know, coming up. But um, it's the, the reason I did this was because I had sold a lot of these guys out to customers. And so I had a customer write me, and I've since gotten about three emails like this since. They said, you know, the, the Synodonis, the, the, the loose pants are doing great. I really love them. They're, they're great fish. But I, I, I must be making a mistake because I've had them here now for almost seven months and I don't have any, any spawns at all. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, you know, that's so far from, you know, where, what, what that person needs to know to get spawns. Um, so I thought, you know, it's probably, I, don't, I think there are some people who don't realize how convoluted uh, breeding some fish can be. Yeah, definitely. and so I wanted to go ahead and say, okay, this is how this is done. If you want to breed it, you can, but this is what you got to do. <laughs> yeah, definitely, and I'll and I'll have a link to your um, to your channel where people can go and check out your videos, especially the Cynodontus lucipinus uh, video that you posted sure. up. So we'll make sure that the listeners are, are well aware of that, and the, and like I said, that'll go in the show notes. So I've got um, two questions here that I, I'd like you to unpack, but they're definitely in two different paths. Um, and so one would be, 
kind of the high level? Like we keep saying Gadeid. Um, what is for for our listeners? What exactly is a Gadeid? Um, if you could unpack that for them, and then the second would be, um, you know, just kind of going down the list of the species that you carry, uh, or at least that that are in your fish room that you've made at least publicly known on your website or through videos. You know, sure. the the bulk of it are the live bears and the Gadeids, but then you have these. You know, you've got these lake. Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyikan catfish. The where did the lucipinus right. come from? Tang or Victoria? Yeah, they're they're Tanganyika. Okay, okay, Lake yeah, Tanganyika. Lake Tanganyika. Um, you've got you've got a barb, um, and then you've got plecos yep. and some shrimp. So and some shrimp. So I guess um, the second right. the second question right. that's just kind of a different path would be, you know, how did how did these other species get put into the fold? Because obviously, being a member of the ALA and your in your history of being a kid with, sure. with 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 live bears, that all makes sense. And it's just I'm trying to understand how these other guys kind of fit into that equation. So um, I'll, we, I'll, we I'll let you need, I'll let you take it. We need to you explain where the green dragon comes from um, because there's there's I, I've gotten some criticism because some people don't believe the origin story and I, I would be happy to tell the origin story on the green dragon That's I'm excited that. let's do it <laughs> um, sure that well the green dragon is a case where I had a friend here in town uh, in, in Denver I, I was well known for breeding a lot of things but I couldn't breed plecos I couldn't breed plecos to save my life none of my plecos ever bred for me so I had a friend down in Denver who had gotten this pair of fish from a friend of his in Chicago and he said, man, there are these things called green dragons. I said, really? And he says, yeah, he got them from the Czech Republic. And I said, really? So he says, yeah. And he goes, I'm breeding them, but I don't have the, the space to raise up the young. Well, you know, can you raise up the young if I got them to you? And I said, sure. Now, he's a good friend. And he's, a, he's a bit of a character. And he said, you know, you raise them up, and then we'll split 50-50. You know, you sell them through your website, and then we'll split them 50-50. So I said, sure, sure, Bob. No problem. We'll do that. So... Anyway, um, uh, he brought to me some 250 fish he gave me as, as heads and tails, just really tiny. And I was successful at raising them all up and bringing them all up. But in this huge batch of fish, there were only six that could possibly be called green dragons and that they had long fish fins and they had a kind of a greenish hue to them. But everything else was albinos, calicos. Uh, there were some really nice dark chocolates. There was a zillion things, lemon drops. But uh, there was just these couple, and I says, and so I, I, Bob says, where's my first check, you know, from, sell, from selling these fish? He says, Bob, there's only six fish in here that I could possibly sell, and, and um, he says, you're kidding. And I said, no, and he says, you're, you're, you're sandbagging me. You're stealing this money from me. I said, Bob, really? I said, look, you want the fish back? And he said, sure. So, and a lot of short fins. So I put them into five five-gallon buckets and took him over to his house and dropped him off to him. He ended up having to step out. We're good friends, and, and, and I left him on his porch. And so we, we laughed about it, you know, because you're like, you're right. Good. So I was thinking to myself, why is this fish so badly hybridized, and why is it that, that uh, you know, who is it that he got them from that took such poor care of these fish? Well, anyway, um, I had assumed that they were bred in the Czech Republic, and what I had thought was that his friend in Chicago had allowed them to become really badly hybridized, and then he had a couple of pair that came up in, in, in the fish that were around, and he sent my friend, you know, a couple of them. Um, I, then I get an email about now, it's been about almost two years ago now, from a breeder in the Czech Republic, and he says, I am the guy who runs the breeder group that developed the long, thin green drag, the long, thin placostomus and ancestress that were uh, released into the hobby in 2012, and he lists all the fish that they have and what they've done. And then he says, we've never seen the green dragon. We really want it. We don't know how you got green. We've been trying. Can you send us some? And I can't ship internationally. But it told me that, uh-oh, you know, they, they didn't come from there. Well, I come to find out, with the long story short, making a lot of phone calls, checking it all out and everything else, I ended up finding out that there's a, this guy in Chicago had bought some fish in an estate sale uh, from Florida had gotten a bunch of fish from this guy who had been uh, had a number of breeding programs going, but nothing was marked. He didn't really know what what was all there. And so he decided to breed a couple of the fish that this guy had to develop what he called a pineapple albino. So it was an albino long fin placostomus with red pectoral spines, basically. Um, I did get a few of those thrown from the fish that, that I bred out. And I thought they were injuries. I thought, this is really ugly, and I would call for that. <laughs> but it turns out that was what the guy was trying to develop. And in the process of developing that, he got a couple of fish that had this green hue to them. And his wife looked at them at the breakfast table and said, gee, those are green dragons. Well, he only had a couple, and he sent two of those to my friend. 
And so then they came to, and he didn't pursue them. So then they came to me. Uh, and so I found myself with two mutations. And so now I'm in my seventh generation. I've been working with them now for almost eight years. And I've been working on developing the green and the finage ever since. So essentially the green dragon started, you know, is, was developed here at, at Fletch Aquatics. So it is, it is my fish. Um, and I didn't intend for it to be that way. I didn't set out to develop the fish, but it kind of fell in my lap and, uh, I've been working with them since. So that's how the Green Dragon got started. That's an incredible <laughs> story and in how you're able to do all that detective uh, detective work to, you know, contact or have, you know, to, to understand the origins of these fish and talk to somebody from the Czech Republic and then talk to the guy down in uh, Florida, I think you said it was. That's a, that's a well, wild ride. In Chicago, yeah. Well, I was, I was, I was very lucky because I, I was told that the guy in Chicago never responds to emails and it took me a couple of tries to get through to him. He eventually got back to me, and, and uh, so we worked out the details. Um, but some of the things he told me didn't didn't fit. You know, he insisted that the male that he started out with had blue eyes. I've never had a blue eye in any of my green dragons. So I'm not entirely convinced that the information I got was, was all on the money, but um, that's fine. You know, it just tells me that uh, it wasn't an established line when I received it, and that uh, that explained for all the hybridization of it, you know. Wow. Um, so, so yeah, that's how the Green Dragon got started. And so, I, I, yes, I have a lot of live bears, and, you know, I've been always focusing on that. Right now, I've, I've been really working hard on getting the Zephyrus Montezuma going. I've got, like, 15 tanks of them right now, um, and I want to have them released, but I don't want to put them up for release until I have really a lot to offer. Um, but uh, I came across uh, this barb that I saw at a friend's house, and I said, what the heck is that? I've never seen anything so pretty, and he said, that's called the Odessa Barb. So I didn't think anything more about it. I was at a show at a convention about a, oh, a few months later. It was the same year, but a few months later, and here was a guy selling Odessa Barb from his hotel room. So I went in, and they were maybe about half an inch long, and they were just beginning to sex out. They had been raised in tubs in his backyard, and every spring he would go out and scoop them out and bring them to conventions or shows and sell them. So I bought six of them from him. So I um, I brought them home, raised them up, learned how to breed them just as a fun thing on the side. And so I contacted the guy and I said, where did you get these originally? He goes, oh, I got them at the local pet store. And so uh, next time I was in that area, that part of the country, which is Indianapolis, I stopped into that pet store and I explained how I'd gotten this fish and I was breeding it. And it, the, the, the store owner looks at me and says, you're breeding that fish? And I said, yeah. He goes, hold on to it. I said, why? He said, it's not available anymore. I said, well, what do you mean it's not available? He said, well, that line is a really bright, really vivid line, and uh, the, the growers could no longer get enough money for them because they have to throw away the females because you don't sell the females, just selling the males. And they take eight months before the color comes in, and they were just, you know, they were particularly velvety, you know, velvet red, red line. Um, and so, uh, he said the wholesalers wouldn't pay the money, uh, for them that the growers wanted. And so they went ahead and, and diluted the red in the males substantially so that now they can sell the males and the females together because the female is an attractive fish in its own right. Um, and so now all the decibars you get in the stores are, you know, fairly poorly colored males and, uh, they all, you know, the males and females don't look as much different as they actually are. So uh, I thought, huh? So I started. So I started selectively breeding the Odessa barbs to try to get that line consistent for the really great color that that line had. And now I've had them for almost eight years now, nine years. And I've been breeding them, and I have them here by. I've, I don't know how many generations they're into, but I'm at a point now where I breed them about twice a year, and I try to keep on hand. Uh, unsexed fish and then some young sex fish to ship out to customers. So yeah, so I have this barb also. And then um, uh, the, uh, the the Synodonis lucipinus, I used to work at a lab in, in uh, at, at Colorado University, and they were trying to breed them, and they were having a hard time. That they used to they used to have the students go go through uh, the, the the substrate of the aquariums with a siphon, and they would siphon out all the debris through the substrate, and then have students sitting at tables with the shoe boxes, you know, plastic shoe boxes. And everybody would get a couple cups of water with some of the debris in it. And with, like, magnifying glasses, they would, with the pipettes, they would pick the eggs out. And that's how they got the eggs to the, to the synodontist. And then they would try to raise them up, you know, in separate tanks. 
And needless to say, it wasn't at all efficient. And so uh, Dr. Cruz, who I worked for, said, you know, is there any way we can, we can get the breeding of these guys, you know, better? And I said, you know, I'd really love to work with them and figure it out myself. And so I took them home. And that was, again, seven, eight years ago, and I've only gotten the, it, the, their breeding dialed in in the last year or so. Yeah, so that's why I have those guys. But I still keep a lot of the live bears. Um, I have a, a, a five or six species of Gadeids now. I have, uh, I'm down to, I think, three or four species of sword tails, but I don't really want to carry many more sword tails. The gold Alvarez I are being bred back out. They're still going to be a, a while before I have them offered again. Um, but I have the Montezuma, the uh, Zephophorus heleri, Rio Otapas, and the Zephophorus Maii, which are the largest sword tails in the world, and they're they're spectacular. They're they're a great fish. And, and so, what's um, what's the status fraud. with your uh, mm-hmm. Pacilia velifera? Velifera? Am I pronouncing that right? Ah, uh, yes, the the velifera. Yeah, velifera. the uh, the velifera, the the giant Yucatan sailfin mollies. Yeah, the beautiful, um, that's, absolutely beautiful fish, yeah. and it is a it is a large live bear too. I mean, you know, we're we're so used to thinking of you know, the, the locally available platies and mollies and guppies and this thing, you know, watching the videos and seeing pictures of them, they're, they're beastly. Oh, yeah, those males will get to be six inches long. And, you know, I knew from the very start of Select Aquatics that I would have to carry that fish. If I wanted to carry the iconic, as I mentioned, low-hanging fruit of the live bearer world, I always knew that that was a fish I would need to carry, and I would need to carry the Yucatan Peninsula population of them, the original population. But and I even knew where to get them. But I knew that they needed big tanks, and I and it was not a fish that I had ever kept before. And for myself, I know what a learning curve there is for you know many of the things that are here. So I waited until I was really ready before I brought them into the room. I've had them now about five years. And, uh, so, you know, it still has its issues. It's, 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 it, the water quality really needs to be, to be up on those guys. They need a lot of uh, water motion and aeration. Uh, and they need to be multiply fed a day. I feed them about every 90 minutes or so. Every time I walk by, I feed them. Um, and that's why they get as big and as nice as they are. Yeah, and for those, but the, the, to and me, they're, they're one of my favorite fish. Hmm? I'm, I'm sorry. And for those that don't know, the, that particular fish is actually the logo fish for the American Live Bear Association. Right, right, exactly, yep. That's why I always, I mean, that fish was nearly gone from the hobby. Like, nobody was carrying it, and it's, you know, I knew it was going to be very hard to find, but it's the iconic live bearer, you know? It's like, how can someone not have that fish to offer? So, anyway. So, so on that point, though, of, <laughs> of fish availability, I, I have to ask, you know, kind of a two-part question then. the Have you ever gone out into the wild, uh, maybe even within the United States or outside of the United States, uh, to collect fish? Um, and what is the one dream fish that you want to go out and collect in the wild and start breeding and sharing with uh, other hobbyists? <laughs> well, I, I, the only collecting I have done, I have not done any collecting outside of the U.S., which is actually fine with me. Um, I used to do a lot of collecting every year here in Colorado. We would get groups of fish people together, and we knew of little sites where uh, local killifish could be found. Um, they were all illegal, so you had to get in and get out without getting caught. But we would uh, we would do that every year, uh, uh, Fundulus, uh sciaticus, uh, and um, uh, the zebrinus uh, was was always a great great one to get to, to bring in. But anyway, so you know, we would do that. And I had friends that went to Mexico every year. I used to know Dominic Isla, and I was always more than happy to pay him whatever he wanted for the fish when he came back. <laughs> if he was to, willing to go down and, and slog around in the in the rivers and catch them and bring them back. And my health is at a point now where I probably wouldn't want to be out in the middle of a river in Mexico anymore. But, um, you know, I, I haven't, uh, I haven't gone outside of the U.S. to collect. As far as a fish to collect in the wild that I would love to, to do on my own, um, you know, I've been really lucky in that I think I've gotten the fish that I've wanted. And, and I, and, uh, you know, I, I, it took me a year to find the Montezuma strain that I have currently, for instance. Um, so I, I just want to really make sure to hold on to and build out what I've got. Um, I don't really have anything at this point that I, that I, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of fish that I have that, that friends have offered me and, and I've, I've said, yes, I would love to take them. Um, but I'm not quite ready yet. And one of them is the Pacelia salvatoris, which is another Molly, but it's the, uh, used to be called the, you know, the Liberty Molly. Uh, but this is a really nice wild line with bright red fins and blue dorsal. So there may come a time that I'll bring something like that in, but my space is so tight now anymore, and I'm really trying to 
you know, do do right by the fish that I have. So yeah, it's one. That's the hardest part about being a hobbyist is there's, there's a huge discipline thing, and that you can't take on more than you can take care of. Um, and everybody has that problem. <laughs> In the, absolutely, yeah. And I'm at the point right now where you know the gears are turning, and you know what kind of racks can I put into this particular room that I use as my little studio slash fish room. Um, you know, how much, how much of the wrath of the wife can I handle as I set these tanks up and, um, <laughs> right, expand right. my operation a bit. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely can, I can appreciate that. Yeah. You know, there, there is definitely a certain amount of restraint, uh, when it comes to, you know, the hobby and especially when you want to start breeding because then it's, you know, multiple tanks, you need grow out tanks and, um, you know, you don't have to, but if you really want to, you know, take the, uh, take the breeding seriously, it's, you know, it's kind of a, something that you have to do. Well, I was going to say, anybody who comes here and visits and gets a tour of the fish room, one of the first things I point out is that every fish you see is going to be in at least three tanks, if not four. Um, that way I don't lose anything. Um, even I, I, I don't get diseases here very often. It's, it's extremely rare, which is, you know, knock on wood. But, you know, you want to keep things in good enough numbers. I had a friend who used to say, never give a fish away unless you have at least 30. You know, and that's not a bad rule to keep in mind. Um, cause that's, that's the kind of rule to keep the fish in the hobby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely keeping uh, 30, probably across two different tanks. Right. So they're not all in the same, yep. in the same population. Um, so then on the, on the, well, nutty... Oh, go for it. Yeah. Well, I was going to say there's, there's, there's one more thing. I, sh I, one thing I should mention the biggest problem in the hobby, and it was certainly the case when I started select aquatics. I don't know that it's as much the case now because many fish are easier to get a hold of either through me or through Corey McElroy or a number of other people. But when I first came into the hobby in 2008, 2009, I first came into Select Aquatics 2008, 2009, I was, I was looking for these rare fish that, that weren't as common anymore. And through entirely good intentions, I obtained a number of times fish that were in extremely poor health genetically because they had gone through uh, five or six or seven or more different uh, tanks and husbandry situations because someone would get the fish, really pleased that they got them, and knew how rare they were. They would breed them once, get a couple of pair, and then ship them off to somebody else. That person, so excited to get this rare fish, would breed them up, you know, get two pair, and send them off to somebody else. And then by the time I got them, you know, that this had happened to no fish, no generation had spent more than one generation in, in the same husbandry conditions. You know, none of the fish I was, uh, had spent more than a generation in the same husbandry conditions. So uh, the fish were often poorly colored. They were undersized. Uh, uh, the Scipia black beauties, I wasn't able to keep going. I did farm them out to some other people to try to keep them going, simply because I couldn't put the time into them here because they were dealing with those issues. And those issues were well-meaning, you know, from people trying to keep them going, but it was actually the worst thing for the fish. And so what's happened is now that I've had these fish here, made them for over 10 years, their color is different. They're twice the size they were when I first obtained them, um, that sort of business. And that's, that's as important when you're keeping these guys as just making sure that, they, that they're getting fed and they're getting good water. Yeah, it's it's really difficult. I mean, the the discipline aspect of, you know, when you set up a tank and if you're going to have a fish species and if you want it to, to really thrive, and especially if you're going to get into the breeding realm, um, to know that you should hang on to it for the long haul, um, you know, and, and to hear that your experience is that, hey, these things are getting bigger, they're getting healthier, they're getting more colorful. Um, you know, hopefully people listening to this are, are, you know, that makes it, that gives them even more incentive to want to really hold on to these fish for a longer period of time than maybe what they were initially thinking. Oh, yeah. No, um, uh, I talk about this and show pictures of how the Xenotoka dodroy has changed since it's been here. There was a picture that appeared in a journal uh, over in Europe of the do of the dodroy. At that time, it was called Eisenai San Marcos. And we all laughed when we saw it at a convention when it first appeared because it, it appeared to be, and it is, heavily photoshopped. I mean, this fish was just spectacularly colored. But we all had that fish, or many people did. I ended up finding it, but they didn't look anything like that, you know. And so I finally got a couple pair, brought them back here, and they looked like squat. The pictures I took of them, I couldn't sell them. They, they were ugly. So I just forgot about them. I stuck them in a 40-gallon breeder, um, gave them good water, good food, and took care of them. And after about a good two to three years, I thought, well, I better go down there and pull some out and take some new pictures because I'm not selling any. I'm just taking care of them. They're, they're bopping along, but they're, you know. And I put them in a photo tank and was shocked at what I saw. 
because they were a totally different fish. And so now the fish I have now, which is a really a beautiful fish, it doesn't look anything at all like the fish I initially acquired. <laughs> Oh wow! And it was because the person I yeah the person I acquired them from was was not taking very good care of them, was feeding them expired food that was given to them by a local pet shop. Um, they were fed infrequently, that sort of thing. And so when I got them and they're getting you know fed three four you know two three times a day and the water changes and all that, um, it made a huge difference over time over generational time. And uh, so now they're one of my best selling fish. Yeah, it is a. It's definitely a beautiful fish, and you know. Uh, again, I would encourage people to go to your website and check out, um, you know, everything that you have to offer. Especially, you know, look at the pictures of the doa dry. Um, it, it color wise, though, it almost looks like if you, and please don't take this by any means as a slide, but if you let a, a kid, you know, with a box of crayons go to town, it's almost like that's how colorful the fish is, right? It's these very vibrant oh, yeah. vertical yeah. bars, like thick vertical bars of. Um, what I perceive to be kind of reds and blues and and golds and uh, and then another bar of kind of a reddish a reddish blue. It's it's yeah. a really unique, uh, well, very unique colored fish. Well, and it's funny because there was a dull green in them initially, <laughs> and that's not there anymore. So you know who knows. But um, you know there was no selective breeding that went on. I didn't pull anything out ever. I just fed them well and took good care of them, and you know here we are. Wow. So, you know, and that's, that's the advantage of keeping something long term and not just, you know, turning right around and passing them out to somebody else and possibly, you know, some people who, who want to sell them and, you know, get money from them right away. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't help the fish. So, yeah, so yeah, to, to make a long story short and make a huge answer, answer short. No, there's no money being made in this. <laughs> <laughs> profits, profits, you know, that is not my primary focus. But I would love to think that these fish will be around uh, for a lot longer than they would have been if I hadn't done what I'm doing. Yeah, you, you know, I, I think people listening to this conversation, that you know, I, I think that's really coming through in in everything that you're saying and you're in in the way that you're you're talking about these fish. That you know, you are are definitely a passionate um, fish nerd, hobbyist first, and you know, the, your your ability to sell these fish and to um, get them to hobbyists is, is you know whether or not you're turning a profit is definitely secondary um, because you know hearing right. hearing the way you talk about the fish, hearing kind of the practices that you do, going the extra mile. Um, you know, sometimes including an extra fish or, you know, a handful of extra, uh, neocaridina shrimp when somebody wants some of those. I mean, those aren't the things right. that somebody that's, that, you know, is watching their profit margin like a hawk. Those aren't things that, that, uh, that person is doing. Yeah. Those are things that a passionate hobbyist that just wants to share fish with other people. Th those are the things that that kind of person does. And, and that's exactly what you're doing, Greg. So that's, I think that's fantastic. It's well, thanks, and it's kind of blurring the line between being a, a club person because I, you know, I belong to lots of clubs, involved with lots of clubs. You get a new member that walks in. What do you do? You give them some free fish. You tell them all about how excited you are about the fish. You you, you turn them on to a tank that you want them to buy for you know a fifty gallon tank for twenty bucks, and and you know you, you get them going. And that kind of ethic pairing, you know, and so. Um, I kind of want to, I'm, 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 I'm kind of spreading that kind of, that kind of ethic and, and, uh, but doing it as a business, not the best business plan, but, uh, it, it's, it, you end up, you know, cause the whole point is to save these fish. These, you know, the fish may not go extinct cause there's many people in Europe that are keeping a lot of these and such, but it could very easily go extinct in the U S. Um, some of the fish I have here, uh, you know, if I stop tomorrow, I really don't, I really can't say that they'll be in the hobby in the U.S. Um, and it's not because people don't keep them, but most people don't keep them for very long or, um, I've, cause I've shipped out a lot of stuff. I had a situation once where I lost a species and I thought, well, no big deal. I'll contact customers and get them back. And this was now many years ago, but it was really discouraging because I contacted, I think, six customers and nobody still had them after it was about, you know, about a year or so after most had bought them. And so I, I, and it wasn't bad feelings. It wasn't anybody had a hard time. It was, you know, well, I moved on to other things or I no longer have the tank or whatever. And so the, 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 there are not that many people that are just a reservoir, a place where these fish can be generated from and it won't change. Um, you know, I, I don't know of anybody else other than myself with a lot of these that's, that was, that's doing that for live bears. I know there are people for cichlid in the cichlid world to do that. But uh, for live bears, I, I don't know of, of, of many. And, I, and I've even put up a letter on my website a long time ago now saying, please keep these. 
you know, it's it's an open letter to hobbyists, fish stores, a lot of. And I said, here are the species you need to focus on. This is these are the species that I feel are, are closest to disappearing from the U.S. hobby. I'll help you get set up. I'll give you all the information you need to to do what I'm doing if you'd like. And I've had two people contact me uh, to take me up on it, and they were both in Canada. Um, and uh, at this point, neither one of them, to my understanding, has 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 gotten it going. But I'm waiting. You know, the opportunity's there. Um, it's a lot of work. It's not a lot of money, but um, you are saving some things. And I'll tell you, it's a lot of fun. You know, I deal with great people. Um, I I spend I get about twenty to forty emails a day, and I answer everybody within twenty four hours. Um, so I meet lots of great people, and, uh, and occasionally I get asked to speak at fish clubs, and that's always a blast. Yeah, so let's so, give yeah. you that opportunity to have the public service announcement. What, uh, what are those species that, um, you know, main, I, I assume they're probably not your, you know, you're not, they're not the ones that are moving very fast on your website, but which, which are these fish that, you know, if, if, if somebody were to say, hey, Greg, you know, I want some of your fish, um, you pick like which ones from from a conservation standpoint should I keep and I'm going to keep these for the long haul and try to breed them and share them with other people uh I have two that come to mind immediately uh the zoogeneticus tequila that you mentioned earlier um they've been considered extinct in the wild for 40 years there's been five formal reintroduction attempts of that species to the wild one that's going on right now and none have been successful but then the reintroduction of any of these fish has not been successful back to the wild. So none of them have been successfully reintroduced for a number of reasons. Um, the other species I think of is, is one that I saw on a uh, speaking tour that I did recently in a fish room of somebody who just happened to have them, didn't realize he'd bought them like 20 years ago and had just been kept them chugging along and just didn't tell anybody about it. But Aetanobius tauri, and it's not the it's not the line that was always well known in the hobby. It's not the line with the black stripe on the side. It's the males actually are a solid blue green, the whole body, and the fins are blue green. Um, it's a very pretty fish um, with the proper light and with the light on it. Just uh, it, it just makes for a real nice fish. And so I, after about two years of working with them, I finally got them breeding up now, and now I have about four tanks of them. Um, and I'm and uh, I'm pleased to, that they're that they're in good number, but I don't know that they exist anywhere else in the U.S. They might only ex they might exist in one more place. But there's an example of a fish. If I were to let it go, it would just disappear. This particular population of the tauri. And, and that's the uh, bluefin gadid or towers gadid. Yes. Yep. yep. That, that's a good looking fish yep. too. So if somebody listening to yeah. this, you know, if if you want to. Uh, participate in your club's CARES program. I'm sure both, I, I know for sure the tequila is on the CARES list. I would assume the Tower I would also be on the uh, uh, CARES list. You know, contact Greg and. I, yeah, get, I believe it's a species that's considered threatened in the wild. So I don't know whether it's a CARES fish or not, but it may be. But I've got a couple of CARES fish here, so they would all be good choices. And then let's, a, let's ask you some, uh, kind of wrap this up with a difficult question. So if you could only keep sure. three of the species, right, Greg, you've got to you've downsize, you know, you're, um, you, you're wanting to travel a little bit more and vacation or, or whatever it is you want to do, go on some longer cruises, um, really enjoy yourself. What are the three species um, that are currently, at least maybe the ones that are on your website, because I don't want you to divulge any of the secrets that maybe you've got brewing in the back room, uh, but what are, the, what are the three that you would absolutely have to keep going? Well, any cruises would be nice. <laughs> longer, longer cruises. I don't know. As it is, I, I haven't been able to get away from the house for more than two to three days uh, for the last couple of years, and so that 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 line of thought it goes through my head all the time. And um, if it wasn't for the excitement that I have for the the breeding projects I've got going on, I mean, I would probably think more aggressively in that direction. But um, I would probably keep the Montezumas around here simply because. I'm beginning to really get them dialed in, and it's not a fish that m many people can breathe in large numbers. Um, uh, the Vellifera, because, like I say, it's the iconic fish, and it also is a fish that takes special care, and they're doing well here, and I would hate to have them disappear. Um, uh, the, the, well, you know, the, see, the thing is with the green dragons, um, I'm developing something that I've been working on. This is another project. You talk about failures. I've been working on this fish now for about seven years. It's it's a it's a variant that I've been working on of the green dragons, and it's going to be get this. It's going to be a extravagantly thin fish, you know, really long finish, pure white, 
with pink eyes. Oh wow! And and so I've been told by numbers of people that have been that have tried that this is impossible and it can't be done. I've been trying now for about seven years, and I have uh, about a dozen fish <laughs> to show for it. And I haven't yet bred two of them to one another yet. I'm just beginning now to get to to have a, a pair of them bred together because all the fish that I have were produced from breedings of other fish that produced those white fish. And so the goal is to get that. But like I say, it's going to be at least three years before I'm going to have anything that I could, that I think I can offer. So, you know, those kinds of things are going to keep me doing this for a while. <laughs> that is incredible, incredible dedication, Greg. I mean, what, what's like, what is it, like a one in a hundred? I mean, what, what's the what's the ratio, I guess, of, you know, of actually getting these, the fish that you're looking for um, to be thrown? Well, I'll tell you why, why it's difficult. Uh, we've all had albinos thrown and you get an occasional white one. But they all die as soon as they hit about an inch and a half along when the endocrine system starts kicking in the, the sexual identification hormones. And this has been documented, and there's a number of people over in Germany I've been in contact with that are studying this phenomenon and working with albinism. And there's also a university back on the East Coast that I'm working with as well. And we've been uh, trying to uh, manipulate food and other environmental factors that could be better to keeping these albinos going. And it seems to be working to some extent. Um, it's getting us toward the development of a hardy fish. But the point is to get them past that sexual maturity because um, about one out of 100 will be all white. And then about one out of every, well, uh, in seven years, I've easily watched 150 of these whites die. And I've got, like I say, about a dozen of them at this point. But the point is just keeping at it long enough to where you get some that are healthy enough. And once they spawn, then you start to get it dialed in, and the young are going to be a little hardier. And so I've got my first couple spawns um, uh, that were just born in the last two months of one pair of whites going. I've got four breeding groups of whites happening at this point. Um, and who knows, you know, whether it's going to whether we're going to get there. But we're dealing right now with really fragile fish and a, and a, and a really questionable. Uh, uh, genetic lineage in the sense of we don't know whether they're going to be fertile with you know whatever um so you know it'll be a few years but i would like to think i've gotten closer to it at this point than anybody else has um but who knows oh that's incredible <laughs> is the is the albinism that you're referring to like the the um you know them dying off when the 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 you know, sexual hormones kick in. Is that something that's exclusive to the captive breads um or is it something that also occurs in the wild um, it's, it's, it, it, it only occurs in, in the whites that come into the world really genetically at a disadvantage to begin with. The regular albinos are healthy and hardy and they do fine. Um, I imagine when the regular albinos appear in the wild, they, they probably do okay until their, their color gives them away and, you know, they, they're hit by predators. But, uh, the whites, they, they, I'm sure that they just last minutes in the wild. Um, you know, that's the whole point is we're, we're taking something that appears really rarely, uh, and then trying to develop it. And at this point, there's been a number of uh, factors that have kept, uh, kept them from where they've become sexually mature. And of course, you can't breed them if they're not sexually mature. So we're, I finally got the first couple that are, that have, that have made that, that cross. And, and, uh, we're, we're hoping that the young that we get are, we're hoping that those fish are fertile. And so far from young, one batch of young we've got, Two batches of young we've got, they're fertile, but we don't know how these young are going to be. They, they may not make it past, uh, the, or the, and then when, if they do make it past and become sexually mature, we don't know if they're going to be fertile. So you're but almost, yeah, you're almost still, shaking your fist at nature and genetics at this point, right? <laughs> With this fish. Oh, it's just fun, you know, it's, it's yeah. a game. It's fun. Yeah. It's a fight. You're, you're, yeah, you know, you're, you're working your way through the various little pathways and seeing if you can get yourself out, out of the maze. Yeah. And Greg, I think the last question that I have, it's going to be kind of a random one, but it, it, it just popped in my mind recently um, towards the, you know, the last few minutes of this conversation. Um, I, I guess upstairs in your main living part of your house, do you have like a centerpiece show tank or are all the tanks relegated to downstairs and they're a part of your select aquatics <laughs> operation? Because I'm dying to know if you have my, a, like a centerpiece show tank upstairs. Like 99% of fish keepers who has a wife, my wife sees my aquariums as a as a, as a as a disaster waiting to happen. So we made an agreement long ago. I even bought a really nice show tank once, and my wife said, "No, nope, she's not giving in. Doesn't care how nice it looks." 
so I can't keep it at an aquarium in the, in the house anywhere. And and she used to used to the used to joke was when I was a hobbyist is that if you come to the house and you visit, um, you have to leave with more fish than you bring. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, then I will. Uh, yeah, I would jump on a plane and come visit you in Denver and uh, and come home with some fish. <laughs> That's yeah, fantastic. Definitely. Well, Greg, this has been a fantastic conversation. I mean, you are just an absolute. Um, you know, uh, I mean, not to play on your name, but a sage. I mean, you, you're you, the wisdom that you oh, have, thanks. the experience that you have is fantastic. Um, I would highly, highly encourage people to check out your website, check out the videos that you're putting up. Um, it's definitely outside of you know what they may expect from a normal YouTube channel for fish. It is, I mean, this is knowledge based. This is all very academic and very much, um, you know, the, yeah. from the perspective of a breeder and a hobbyist. And I think there's yeah. a lot of people that, no. that want that. So I would say go check, definitely check out Greg's channel. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not going to be doing YouTube videos where I'm ever talking about what I had for breakfast. <laughs> it isn't going to happen. <laughs> or do the uh, do the selfie camera where you're just walking around doing nothing but selfies, and yeah, that's <laughs> right, oh, that's always right. that's always a good time. So, Greg, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much, sir, for taking time to talk with me, and uh, I, I look forward to connecting with you again in the future, and hope to have you on and and you know go di go deeper in, into some of these topics that you uh, specialize in. Oh, Randy, man, thank you so much, and yeah, you're always welcome. Just give me a call, let me know, and then we can do it again. Oh, fantastic, Greg. Thank you very much, sir. You have a good one. Bye, you too. Take care. Thank you again for listening to the Aquarius Podcast. As always, get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds.